Triton II, the largest and the most powerful ballistic missile in our arsenal. 54 are currently deployed at three strategic air command locations. came on telling you that launch sequence has started. You're on right, right, battery right. activated light. There's two 28 volt batteries on that missile that have never been charged. They're force fed electrolytes right now and in 28 seconds that missile will be on its own power when no longer need us. Next is a soft silo light. Now that silo door is sliding open and we will get an alarm in this system. So we know the door is open. Next is a guidance go light. It's communicating with a MIGAC but it won't accept any changes. It knows exactly what it's going to be doing. Followed by an engine fire light. Now when that engine ignites, it's going to do a lot of damage to that side. Pretty much will destroy it as it follows out of there. It's going to stall so it's going to want to fire. So that's what this is moving into. Four seconds later, you have a liftoff light. About another four or five seconds, the missile is actually cleared the side. 58 seconds from the time she and I turned those two keys, that missile would have been on its way to target number two. 30 to 35 minutes from now, which is a flying time depending on the distance to your target, I can pretty much guarantee you there's nobody in this room that's going to want to be anywhere near target number two. The complex itself built to withstand a minimum overpressure of about 300 pounds per square inch. Now, these doors will actually withstand roughly 1,000 pounds. Give you a little perspective on that. Hurricane, tornado generating somewhere in the area of 5 to 8 pounds of overpressure will level a house, and about 12 to 15 pounds would take down almost any commercial site. So once you got past this doorway, uh, both the equipment and the crew were very well protected. Okay, first of all, let me start off by telling you a little bit about the facility you're in because it's a little bit unique. You're on the second level of a three-story structure. Above us is the cruise quarters that you saw in the movie and directly underneath this level three is an equipment level. It does have a lot of the equipment that actually operates the complex. Not all of it certainly, but a considerable amount of it. Bottom row lights do relate to the complex itself. The center row of lights is your re-entry vehicle, missile guidance systems and power selections. Uh, you've got your targeting selection here, you've got an abbreviated launch sequence, you've got communication selections, and you've got a rotary telephone, which was very up-to-date and current in the late 60s or early 60s when these places were being built. Second in command, deputy combat crew commander, was usually a first or a second lieutenant. This console is the one that that person would occupy. Now the deputy was primarily responsible for the communications, the safety, and the security of the crew. Every other place, though, in this entire complex, you always had to be in eye-to-eye -eye contact with a second qualified individual. And on this level, right here, one of those two people had to be one of these two commissioned officers. The deputy was also responsible for monitoring and overseeing the operation of what they refer to as an EWOL clock, the Emergency War Order Clock, and they often refer to it as a launch clock. That is a timepiece that they would have used for any time coordination going through any kind of a launch sequence. It's a uh, hand-wound 24-hour eight-day clock. It was wound every Sunday morning, and it was hacked or checked anywhere from two to four times a day with the atomic clock in Boulder, Colorado, because that clock always had to be within at least one second of the correct time. It, well, the crew was a very highly trained enlisted person. It was usually a sergeant and referred to as an MFT, or Missile Facilities Technician. That individual had to have a working knowledge of every system in operation down here that actually operated the complex, and there was a bunch of them. They could cover everything from hydraulics to pneumatics to air conditioning, sewer systems, generators, pumps, fans, fire abatement systems. Uh, the, the list just goes on and on. And that was primarily for maintenance reasons. In addition to that, they were also responsible for monitoring the power that came in here. Now, crews never had any identifying information regarding their targets. 
They had no idea what, what, where it was, and they had no idea what it was. They just knew they had those three targets. That was classified then. One of the very few things about Titan that's still classified today, we still don't know what those targets were. But Commander had never been instructed to change to an alternate for any reason. All they would have to do is push button one or three, whichever they've been told to change to, hold that in for about three seconds, that would reprogram the guidance system. That now became your target until you were told to do otherwise. Those on duty would have been grabbed one of these two binders, and inside the very simple form they were going to be filling out, and as you can see, they usually did it in grease pencil. They were going to be receiving a 35 character alphanumeric message that would have sounded something similar to this. Okay, that message was 35 characters long. They would both write it out in the appropriate form. They then had to verify and agree among the, between the two of them that they had a valid message. They had to agree to the format and they had to agree to the content. If they did, they then had the authority to open the safe because there are some things in there they needed. First thing they would pull out of there is a stack of authenticator cards to authenticate that this message was valid and did come from the president. A seven character portion of that message was used for that. The first two characters would identify which card they would look for. And the card might have been, uh, those characters might have been <clears throat> Bravo Delta. So they would reach in there and they would look, pull them out and they would look for a card that had BD on it. Pull it out, snap it open. Inside were going to be five additional characters. Those characters had to match exactly the next five characters in that portion of the message. All seven identified exactly. They knew it was valid. They had the authority to launch. Built, put in place, and served for almost 24 years was to serve one purpose and one purpose only, and that was to be a deterrent. A deterrent is probably just described as the ability to put in the mind of your enemy the fear to attack. Because we feared them attacking us, and they feared us attacking them. Had we ever done this in a real scenario situation, the bottom line in the resort would have been something they referred to as man. Mutually assured destruction. Because you're never going to win all of it.